Good morning. Scripture reader this, uh, this morning will be Nehemiah 1, verses 1 through 6. Nehemiah 1, 1 through 6. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, now it happened in the month of Chislev, in the twelfth year, as I was in Susa, the citadel, that Han- Hananiah, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judea, and I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates are destroyed by fire. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments, Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you, even I and my father's house have sinned. Thank you, Kevin. It's great to see everyone today. Things are getting better. It's at least getting warmer. Uh, I'm not sure if that's better, but it's good to see some new people back and uh, just being able to rejoice and praise God is always a good thing. Uh, Iron sharpens iron. We want to talk a little bit about some of the things that we do with each other. If you watch the news, you can see all kinds of things that we do to each other and that doesn't turn out very well. When you read the Bible, you see lots of things we can do with each other to encourage each other, to lift each other up. And it does some amazing things. In fact, if you look at the Bible and you look at how things work in history, God does some things that we really can't even imagine. It is so big and so amazing what he is able to do. He involves nations. He brings Egypt, or he brings Israel out of Egypt. They walk across a desert. They get to a promised land. They have this government in this promised land. And what a great thing it is. And kings are lifted up. And they do so great for a little while. And then they don't do so great. And then some of the kings are wicked. And then the people turn wicked. And You wish it just worked this way, that everything was always positive, that everything was always up and up, that everything was always a way in which we could look and say, man, that is great. I think we can, but sometimes it's in the middle of a disaster that we can see what God is about to do. And we can see some great things that are coming and some ways in which God is going to do this. Finally, the kingdom is divided with Israel and Judah. Israel is completely lost. Judah doesn't do a whole lot better. In fact, when you begin to look at Judah and some of the things that happen with them, it's really not very good what happens. They are finally taken away into captivity in Babylon. This is a world stage that God works on. They spend 70 years in captivity. They had torn down everything, all of the walls, all of the temple, destroyed the whole city, taken the whole people away. And finally, after 70 years, they're brought back. They're allowed to come back and start to rebuild their city. And it eh, doesn't go all that well. They have a place. They're rebuilding the house, and it's kind of there. But they don't have a temple. They don't have any walls. It hasn't gone back like it was in the time when God was blessing them, and it's just loss. There's a lot of ruin, and it's been hundreds of years, and over all of this time, you're able to look and see all the things that God is doing, and 
you realize, well, what's going to happen now? What's God going to do about this? And that's the point at which we pick up Nehemiah and start talking about what Nehemiah says. Nehemiah is one of those captives who was taken away. And now he is serving the king of Persia as the cupbearer to the king. Very important position. That means he gets to try all the drinks first. And if he doesn't die, then it's okay. Wouldn't you like to have a job like that? Well, at least you get to go first. It's, you know, maybe not the best if things don't turn out so well, but uh, you are in a privileged position, and this king did trust him. He asked about what's going on back in my homeland, and he gets the news. The gates are all burned. There's no city walls. The temple isn't there. Everything is in ruin. Well, that's not good. That's not good at all. And so he is so upset by this, he begins to weep. He begins to pray to God about this. He mourns with prayer and fasting. And so as he talks to God, he tells God about what he wants to do and about what God promised. Because God's promise was, is that you're going to be taken captive for 70 years, and then you're going to be able to come back. Well, that's a great thing. 70 years was up. Some people had already gone back under Zerubbabel. Not him. And it wasn't any better. We always think when God promises something, well, then it's going to be great. It's just going to work out wonderful. And it is. As long as we are involved in it and are making it happen. Now, that is a big condition, isn't it? And so he sees the need. He sees what he wants to happen. And about this time, Ezra is starting back to rebuild the temple. And he sees this need and he realizes that, you know, this is not good. We're not satisfied with where things are. And it almost doesn't matter where we are. We want things to be better. We would like things to improve a little bit. We would like for certainly health situations to improve a lot now. Well, as he is there before the king, the king hears about it. And I'm going to shorten the story by a whole bunch saying that the king heard about it and decided that he was going to send him back. He was going to let him go back and rebuild all the walls if he could do that. And so he finances the trip. And so he goes back with the authority of the king. As he goes back, he walks around the city at night to try and see what he can do. What is the plan? What can we accomplish with all of this? Well, God had already promised 70 years you go back. Yeah. So what's the problem? There's no walls up. Well, why not? God, why didn't you put up walls? I think God's looking at them saying, why didn't you put up walls? Sometimes we expect it just to be automatic, just because God promised it and said it's going to happen. It can happen, but it doesn't usually happen without people of faith being involved in it and being able to do something with it. And so that's an important thing for us to realize is that that's what happens. Nehemiah gets back. He walks around at night, looks at all the gates, looks at all the walls, comes back and calls the people together. And he says, here is what I want you to know. He says, then he said to him, you see the trouble we are in and how Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem so that we may no longer suffer derision. And he told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good, and also of the words of the king had spoken to me. And they said, let us rise up and build. For they strengthened their hands for the good work. But when Sanballat and the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite, the servant of Geshem the Arab, heard of it, They jeered at us, and they despised us, and they said, What is this thing that you are doing? Are you rebelling against the king? Then I replied to them, The God of heaven will make us prosper, and we his servants will arise and build 
but you have no portion or right or claim in Jerusalem. This is an amazing passage to me. He calls the people together, and, and just look at the wording here of what he does. We're in trouble. Let's build. That is a stirring speech, isn't it? I mean, that is amazing motivation. We're in trouble. We ought to build. But then the next part is on here as well. He says, do you realize how I got here? I was standing in front of a king. I'm a nobody. I'm a captive. And I was upset. And the king says, what's the matter? And I said, well, I need money. Just send me back and let me rebuild Jerusalem, an entire city that has been burned down for this long a period of time. And I'll just come back and then I'll serve you again. The king said, okay. Okay, that seems like God's working in his life. And then he's gotten back there, and then he financed the trip, and then he bought wood for the gates, and he's able to bring all of that back. So they've got the resources, and the people looked at this and said, you know, it seems like God's working here. It seems like God's doing something here. And so they say, we ought to build. Well, that's great when both of you agree on that, don't you think? And so they decide to start, but there are enemies there already. And the enemies don't like this. The enemies are going to laugh at them. The enemies are going to attack them. The enemies are going to do everything they possibly can to do this. Oddly enough, it's reported that this is actually some of the wall built by Nehemiah. It dates back that far. It's still standing this long afterwards. I mean, this wall is over 2,000 years old. How many walls do you build that last that long? This wall is just a piece of what it was. But they began to put it together. Let us up, rise up and build. And the question then becomes, well, how are you going to do that? Hasn't that been the problem all along? Well, you know, we don't have any people. He says, just take the bricks in front of your house and build the wall there. And every single person, take the bricks in front of your house and you build that wall there. It's not a massive building program. Let's all meet together and let's all figure out how. Just take the bricks in front of your house, your bricks, your wall. Just build that part. And they say, okay, well, I could do that. I mean, I know where my house is and where I live on the wall, and yeah, I could just do that, and each person decides to do that, and when each person decides to do that, the whole wall is built, and it begins coming together. The stones were still there. The ones that they had torn down and burned and destroyed and hauled off and, well, they didn't haul them very far, they're still there. And what you have to do is just bring them back and put them back together, and I'm making that oversimplified. What made the difference in them being unable to do it and sitting there in a place that had been destroyed in ruins? And all of a sudden, now they're able to build this wall again, or at least be able to start. Well, Scripture tells us this part as well, Nehemiah 4. So we built the wall. Okay. <laughs> and all the wall was joined together to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. How did you get that? Well, I said, look what God's doing in my life. Look how God got me here. And I walked around and I looked at it and I said, I think we can each do our own part. You just have to do your part. And that's all you have to do is you just do your part in front of your wall. You've given them a mind to work. They still had the same enemies. They still have the same people against them. They have the same people. They had to eventually carry swords because they're making so much progress, other people are attacking, 
And yeah, they're trying to tear down the wall, not only the wall, but kill them. So they have to fight. They have to go against these people. They have to take this pile of stones and make that into a wall. Well, that can be pretty difficult to do. But it's worth it, isn't it? And so as they begin to build and they begin to see this wall come together, they realize that we need to get this done because as soon as they put up some and they leave and go home for the day, they come back and it's all torn down. Well, then we've got to stay there and protect it, and we'll build the rest of it. And so they stayed there until they didn't eat, and they didn't sleep, and they did nothing else but build a wall. And they had moved from wherever they had in the country with their, you know, other house, nice house away that wasn't in the middle of the rubble into the place where, okay, I own this section let me build the wall. And so they camp at the wall night and day. They don't change their clothes because that wall is their responsibility. That wall is where they need to be and they work night and day with no vacation, no time off, everyone together because they wanted to do something. And they built a wall. It was the most important thing for them to do that. And so the wall was finished. On the 25th day of the month of Elo, in 52 days. And when all the enemies heard of it, all the nations around us were afraid and fell greatly in their own esteem, for they perceived that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. If we'd known that's how long it took, wouldn't we have done it before? I mean, why is this like this? I think it's like this because we find ourselves in this situation a lot. It was impossible. Well, why was it so impossible? Because you need God to be part of it. And they had seen it as impossible to finish. They have enemies that are there. They have people, uh, they basically have to move into where their job is, and they have to stay there day and night, and they have to battle, and they have to build, and they have to come together, and they have to fight until finally it is finished. Now, I don't think this is Nehemiah's part of the wall. This is Herod's part of the wall that's going to come much later but it changed how other people saw themselves. And other people saw God is with these people. God is doing something with these people. How incredible that is. And they had lost their esteem in themselves because they recognized God helped them. God did something there. And so what made the difference? The workers were there already. The stones were there already. So what was the problem? Why didn't they build the wall? They knew what was needed. They knew it was God's will. They knew the prophecy. They knew the promise. They knew it should be done. Why wasn't it done? Why do things that God wants get left undone? when we already know about it. If we just had somebody who would invent a logo that says, you know, just do it, wouldn't that be great? And we could adopt that maybe as a Bible saying of just do it. Well, I think there's a couple of reasons for this. I think, first of all, there are things that are done in God's time. Even though God talked about it, even though God promised it, even though God said it, I think there are things that are done in God's time when God sets it up. And I think that just happens that way. It seems to come from God. Was it Nehemiah? Is he the guy? And you just needed that one leader to come in? And no, I don't think so. Nehemiah is a convenient guy that God uses. Do you need Nehemiah? You definitely need Nehemiah. 
He needs to come in and he needs to say, go. That's it. We're building. Go. Everybody's agreed. Nehemiah says, I think we can do it. The people says, I think we can do it. Well, then why isn't it up yet? Somebody just needs to say, go. Do you realize that's what happens a lot of projects? You just need somebody to say, go. And that's all it is. And then people start doing their part, and you realize how it comes together. Sometimes it's about God, and he sets the timing. And maybe it's so that we would learn some things from this. Everything is there. We're just waiting for it to be put together. And sometimes it's the guy, but I think it's more God who makes the guy. And this isn't a new story. You can see this over and over again. You can see how God does this with people. You can see how God solves the problem of a sinful world by saying, I'm going to wipe them out with a worldwide flood. Uh, Noah, I need an ark. <laughs> okay. And so God says, and it's time to build. We can see these kinds of things that happen. As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. It's in Proverbs. It is what makes everything work. We push each other. We accept responsibility from each other. We accept motivation from each other. You need somebody to say go. And as soon as somebody says go, well, that's all I needed is for somebody to say, yeah, let's start. And so then we can start and everything works and accountability goes the same way. It goes back to that same person and says, well, I told you go. Now, why aren't you going? Why isn't it being done like this? And there is relationship that is involved in this where there's one person sharp as another. Well, I'm, I'm kind of afraid. Well, let's work through this. Let's figure it out. What else do you need? Is there more that's needed for this? And we can see this happen sometimes when there's a problem. You run into a difficulty, you run into a problem, and there are th some things that need taken care of. Somebody will ask, can you solve this for us? Yeah. You just need the guy to say, go. <laughs> All right, go do it. And he does. And you think, why did it get to be such a problem? Because you've got to have the guy that says, Go. And it's one of those things that's important. We see this happening in Acts chapter 6. As you see, Grecian widows are not being given their proper food at the proper time. The apostles say, we don't really have the time. That's always a bad excuse to be able to go and take time away from what we're doing, from our ministry of the word and from prayer. We need seven guys. They pick them out. People pick them out. They say, go. And sure enough, it's done, taken care of. I'm sure they picked more people, and it wasn't just a matter of picking seven guys and it's all finished. There's a whole lot of work that's involved in there and a whole lot of other people that are involved in that. But sometimes we do that when there's a problem. Let's figure out the solution, and you just need to ask somebody. We do this when we need to be stronger, when we're completely overwhelmed with everything. And it just seems like nothing is working right. And we're feeling weak and we feel like giving up and we're tired and we need a rest and we get beaten down and there's just too much criticism. And it's just overwhelming, isn't it? You need somebody there to say, I believe in you. You're doing great things for God, even though things are so difficult around you. You can do great things for God. You can do amazing things for God. But it seems so overwhelming. Sometimes we need to learn some new things, and they could teach us those new things. We do it when, when things need to be done. And so we're going to accomplish it. Does it last forever? No. In fact, it usually, you know, not more than... A thousand years, maybe two thousand, but most of our stuff doesn't last that long, right? Most of our stuff doesn't last 50 years. But in the big scope of time, we're not trying to build it for forever. 
We need it done for now. And that's really what stops us sometimes. Well, I don't know. It might fall apart later on. And it might. We'll do it again. But we just got to start and build something. And so we do it good for our time. And remember where we were and that things need to be done. It's one of those things that's extremely important. Iron sharpens iron. One man sharpens another. I've seen some amazing things in this. Long time ago, 100 years ago, no, feels like that. We were, we were in Idaho and we ran buses. I think you guys ran buses here. Idaho worked with buses more than I've ever seen any other place. It was incredible. We had, I think, a 150-member church and 350 because there were 200 kids that they picked up every Sunday and every Wednesday. That's a big job. And they said, we'll get more. We'll get more. And we were almost like, uh... Go get them. Because you don't ever want to say, stop. No, that's enough. We don't want any more. Are you kidding? What kind of message is that? We just said, yeah, go get more. Go get more. It's not working now. It was for that time. And that's all it was for. And we sometimes get the idea that it's supposed to be forever. It's got to last forever. And it's going to, no, it's for right now. And we do it for right now. And it's an expression of faith that happens right now. And that's what we do. And it is in our time. We weren't changing the world forever. It's nothing on Nehemiah's scale. It's not moving world nations around. I don't have any personal stories like that. I wish I could tell you how we, you know, dealt with all the communist countries and now that we have a complete free world and we have solved every problem in the world and, well, no, we didn't quite do all of that. All we did is pick up kids on a bus and it was a great time of faith. And we saw God working among us. We did stuff like a VBS. We've done that here a little bit. That's one of them from 30 years ago. That little guy sitting there in the whale is 43 years old now. <laughs> so it was neat to see what happened though how you can pull some of these people in together. And we did stuff like that, and it was like, wow, that's neat. We're able to do stuff, and people get excited about it. It's a matter of faith and what we're able to do. And if you do that together with your family, don't leave your family to go do it, but with your family and make them participate with you, it's amazing how much faith it builds in them. How are you going to keep your kids faithful? Well, one is this. And so you do different things that are able to teach children, that are able to make it special, able to bring the Bible story across. Yeah, my son is, my other son is always the one who gets hurt or injured somehow. So uh, that's what kids are good for as well. And so these are just some of the things that you're able to do that make it a big deal. This one's Miami. This is, you know, and you get that many kids together, that many kids working to help you tell the story of the life of Christ. Well, when else do you get a group of teens like that that are going to be willing and have fun? Yeah, I'm Jesus. I pick the roles. You can see Tiffany the Terrible sitting there as Satan. She was perfect. <laughs> but somehow, 
when you do all of this stuff together, it makes a huge difference. This is just a couple years ago, remember this? It makes a huge difference in what we're able to do. And people feel like God's working among us. Does it take some work? Yeah, it takes some work. And no, I'm not trying to push VBS this year, okay? Please don't think that. This is Bible Bowl. Brad works with Bible Bowl. How does he get that many kids to study a book and come and take a test and enjoy it and love the experience and make it so that it's an expression of faith. And this last year, they studied the book of Revelation. They're going to memorize Revelation? Yeah. Okay, that sounds like a great idea. Yeah, Brad's a miracle worker. I don't know how he does all that stuff. It's amazing to watch all that. And then we built a village, right? I know these are old pictures. I don't have any new ones. Somewhere we got to build a new one and, and get some people that are able to do great things. And we're just kind of restarting this now because it kind of had to, you know, stop for a little bit. It's one of the best ways to teach. Kevin and Amanda, make sure you see them. Make sure you talk to them because this is one of the easiest ways I know of to be able to teach kids. And you're going to be excited once you get into this, once you learn how to do this. It does take some work. But if you don't know how to do that yet, this is a way that you can learn how to do it if you just get where you're able to do some things like this. Are these huge things that have made all the difference? No. Nah. But they make a difference now. And they make a difference in your children now. And they make a difference in your faith now. Because if you're not involved in any of this stuff, it's like 10 years later and you're going to go, well, okay, what happened? But when you do this now, it makes a difference in your faith because you realize there's something you're able to build. It's great training for kids, but it's also great training, training for parents in learning how to teach. And so we challenge each other when it's our time. It may not last forever. It just needs to last for now. That's what makes all the difference, to do something that matters. We aren't trying to change the world. We're just trying to express our faith. We're just trying to make a difference in what we do. And it fills your heart, and it makes a huge difference in what goes on. And sometimes we're waiting for the next idea. We need the Nehemiah who says go. We need somebody who's got the idea, the plan, the something and it may not be yours. I've learned that a long time ago. you just waiting to hear it. And as soon as you hear it, say, yeah, let me work with that. Let's build. Can you tell where God is active and moving and working and doing? Are you involved in that right now? I think we're coming out of COVID. We're coming out of some times where it's been a little bit difficult. And we're coming into a time where it's going to be fantastic. It's going to be amazing what God's able to do with this. Because people are tired of sitting around. It's about time we did some things, right? We need to be able to do this. It all begins with your relationship with God, with being able to do some things about your sin about being baptized into Christ, about getting that cleared up first, about getting those things, those sins taken away so that now God is alive, God is active in your life, and that does change your life forever. Can you imagine all these people filled with the Holy Spirit and turned loose by God? Need somebody to say go. So what do you need to do this morning to let God be at work in you? Let's figure that one out. Let's fix that and let's be ready and praying about what we need to do now. Let's stand and sing. Whoa.